guys. How are you doing? So, I actually got some work done today. Yay! So exciting! Like, oh my goodness, so exciting! So let's see about getting this all... Hello! Hey! How are you doing? I, I don't even have the chat open yet. Um... I'm getting there, I'm getting there. Pop out chat. There we go. Yay. So, um, how are you doing today? You, I know I missed my premiere. I'm so annoyed. <laughs> I was recording a video. <laughs> it's like, oh no. And then I went, oh no. And then I went, oh no again. It's like, ah. Ah. Anyway, that's that's just I I've I've actually got it in my list now to um when I premiere something to actually actually have it as a um a reminder on my phone so I don't forget it. Like I said, I was in the middle of recording another video to go out. <laughs> Because it's so nice and quiet here. I won't get interrupted at all. For at least a week. Yay! 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 We need some shakers or something. <laughs> I know, I'm like, I'll put it at 7.30 so I won't forget it. And then it'll be done before I have my stream at 8. And oh boys, oh boys. And then no. No, no, I forget. I forget, I forget. Because I'm horrible, terrible, horrible person. <laughs> terrible, horrible person. Oh well, what do you do? So I'm, I'm going to, um, share this out. Because I always forget to share it out. Oh no, I already shared it out. I need to. Uh, share my share. Share my share. Um, I shared it out. Like just a few minutes ago. Just a few moments ago. Um, just like one minute, two minutes, three minutes, four, five minutes, six minutes, seven minutes more. Uh, come on, come on, move. Uh, okay, there we go, it's moving. Five minutes, and, oh, there I am. Wow, next time, Nadine, tag yourself. Retweet with a tweeter comment. Tweet. I am back. I stream. No audio book club. Audio book club. I stream. Mm. Why can't I remember what the tweeter thing is? Do you know what my tweeter shortcut is? For tweeting that out. I got it there somewhere. Uh, way down in the list. Down, down, down in the burn of the fire. Uh, TWT Book B Cake. Yeah, uh, that's it. Um, ha ha! And, 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 G, D, L, 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 L. Yay! Yay! Oh, where are you? I'm gonna move this. Move this over here so I don't. Um, 
so it's over there. I know I missed my premiere. I'm so sad. Darn it. Darn it, darn it, darn it. Oh well. Poop happens. Right? So today is more of that book club, or the, more of the books, but I'm going to be prepping um, for a project. So, um, I've got, I've got beads galore. I've got beads galore to string. So I'm going to be doing that while we, um, while we listen to the books. And, um, I feel bad. I do. I feel horrible about it. It's like, uh, oops. If I go too much, then I won't be able to get it back out of there. Um, yeah, they, they were for, um, they were mini cupcake molds for, like, some kind of set, you know, kid set or something, but I find they work very, very well for this. <laughs> and, um, you just, it works, it works so well for this kind of thing. And I actually started at the wrong color, but you know, whatever. As long as I don't get mixed up, I'm okay. You know, because that, that would never happen, me get mixed up. No, 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 no. Never. Can't happen. No one's ever seen such a thing happen. <laughs> um, okay, and how are you doing tonight, Dave? It's, it's like, it's like late for you, isn't it? You're, you're across the little pond we got there. If if I remember correctly, and I'm pretty sure I do, I switch my my uh, my purple was a brighter purple. It's more like a lavender, and I can't find a nice purple. But anyway, we've got like a little over an hour worth of. You just getting into bed, yeah? <laughs> I think it was random. A mid night or something. So, um, okay. I'm going to, um, I'm going to start the book up and you can listen while you sleep. Listen while you sleep. Ba -da -ba 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 -ba. Good night, hun. And where is the, where is the, where's the button? Oh, I've got to mute me. Chapter 34 of Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Vlad Amalchuk Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan by Richard Gordon Smith A Story of Mount Kanzanrei Far up on the northeastern coast of Korea is a high mountain called Kanzanrei, and not far from its base, where lies the district of Kankofu, is a village called Teheigun, trading in little but natural products such as mushrooms, timber, furs, fish, and a little gold. In this village lived a pretty girl called Choyo, an orphan of some means. Her father, Choka, had been the only merchant in the district, and he had made quite a fortune for those parts, which he had left to Choyo when she was some 16 summers old. At the foot of the mountain of Kanzanrei, 
lived a woodcutter with simple and frugal habits. He dwelt alone in a broken-down hut, associated with but the few to whom he sold his wood, and was considered generally to be a morose and unsociable man. The recluse he was called, and many wondered who he was and why he kept so much to himself, for he was not yet thirty years of age and was remarkable for his good looks and strong frame. Sawada Shigeoki was his name, but the people did not know it. One evening, as the recluse was wending his way down the rough mountain path with a large load of firewood on his back, he was resting in a particularly wide and rocky pass, darkened by the huge pine trees which towered on every hand, and was startled by a rustling sound close below. He looked nervously round, for the place in which he was had the reputation of being haunted by tigers, and with some truth, for several people had lately been killed by them. On this occasion, however, the sound which had startled the recluse was caused by no tiger, but only by a pheasant which fluttered off her nest and was imitating the sign of a wounded bird to draw the intruder's attention away from the direction of her nest. Strange, however, was it, thought the recluse, that the bird should have so acted, for she could neither have seen nor heard him, and so he listened intently to find a cause. There were not many minutes to wait. Almost immediately the recluse heard the sounds of voices and of scuffling, and hiding himself behind the trunk of a large tree, he waited, axe in hand. Soon he saw being carried, pushed and dragged down the path, a girl of surpassing beauty. She was in charge of three villainous men whom the recluse soon recognized as bandits. As they were coming his way, the recluse retained his position, hidden behind the great pine and grasping more firmly his axe. And as the four approached him, he sprang out and blocked their way. Who have you here and what are you doing with this girl? cried he. Let her go or you will have to suffer. Being three to one, the robbers were in no fear and cried back, Stand out of our way, you fool, and let us pass unless you wish to lose your life. But the woodcutter was not afraid. He raised his axe and the robbers drew their swords. The woodcutter was too much for them. In an instant he had cut down one and pushed another over the precipice and the third took to his heels, only too glad to get away with his life. The recluse then bent down to attend to the girl who had fainted. He fetched water and bathed her face, bringing her back to her senses, and as soon as she was able to speak, he asked who she was, whether she was hurt, and how she had come into the hands of such ruffians. Amid sobs and weeping, the girl answered, I am Choyo Choka. My home is the village of Teegun. This is the anniversary of my father's death, and I went to pray at his tomb at the foot of Gando Mountain. The day being fine, I decided to make a long tour and come back this way. About an hour ago, I was seized by these robbers, and the rest you know. Oh, sir, I am thankful to you for your bravery in saving me. Please tell me your name. The woodcutter answered, Ah, then you are the famous beauty of Tehegun village, of whom I have so often heard. It is an honor indeed to me that I have been able to help you. As for me, I am a woodcutter, the recluse they call me, and I live at the foot of this mountain. If you will come with me, I will take you to my hut, where you can rest, and then I will see you safely to your home. Choyo was very grateful to the woodcutter, who shouldered his stack of wood and, taking her by the hand, led her down the steep and dangerous path. At his hut they rested, and he made her tea, then took her to the outskirts of a village, where, bowing to her in a manner far above that of the ordinary peasant, he left her. That night, Choya could think of nothing but the brave and handsome woodcutter who had saved her life. So much indeed did she think that before the morn had dawned, she felt herself in love deeply and desperately. The day passed and night came. Choya had told all her friends of how she had been saved and by whom. 
The more she talked, the more she thought of the woodcutter, until at last she made up her mind that she must go and see him, for she knew that he would not come to see her. I have the excuse of going to thank him, she thought. And, besides, I will take him a present of some delicacies and fish. Accordingly, next morning she started off at daybreak, carrying her present in a basket. By good fortune, she found the recluse at home, sharpening his axes, but otherwise taking a holiday. I have come, sir, to thank you again for your brave rescue of myself the other day. And I have brought a small present, which I trust, however unworthy, you will deign to accept, said the lovesick Choyo. There is no reason to thank me for performing a common duty, said the recluse. But by so fair a pair of lips as yours, it is pleasing to be thanked, and I feel a great honor. The gift, however, I cannot accept, for then I should be the debtor, which for a man is wrong. Choya felt both flattered and rebuffed at this speech, and tried again to get the recluse to accept her present. But, though her attempts led to friendly conversation and to chaff, he would not do so and Choyo left, saying, Well, you have beaten me today, but I will return, and in time I shall beat you and make you accept a gift from me. Come here when you like, answered the recluse. I shall always be glad to see you, for you are a ray of light in my miserable hut. But never shall you place me under an obligation by making me accept a gift. It was a curious answer, thought Choyo as she left, but, oh, how handsome he is, and how I love him, and anyway, I will visit him again, often, and see who wins in the end. Such was the assurance of so beautiful a girl as Choyo. She felt that she must conquer in the end. For the next two months, she visited the recluse often, and they sat and talked. He brought her wild flowers of great rarity and beauty from the highest mountains and berries to eat, but never once did he make love to her or even accept the slightest present from her hands. That did not deter Choya from pursuing her love. She was determined to win in the end, and she even felt that in a way this strange man loved her as she loved him, but for some reason would not say so. One day in the third month after her rescue, Choyo again went to see the recluse. He was not at home, so she sat and waited, looking round the miserable hut and thinking what a pity it was that so noble a man should live in such a state when she, who was well off, was only too anxious to marry him, and of her own beauty she knew well. While she was thus musing, the woodcutter returned, not in his usual rags, but in the handsome costume of a Japanese samurai, and greatly astonished was she as she rose to greet him. Ah, fair Choyo, you are surprised to see me now as I am, and it is also with sorrow that I must tell you what I do, for I know well what is in both your heart and mind. Today we must part forever, for I am going away. Choya flung herself upon the floor, weeping bitterly, and then, rising, said between her sobs, Oh, now this cannot be. You must not leave me, but take me with you. Hitherto I have said nothing, because it is not for a maid to declare her love. But I love you, and have loved you ever since the day you saved me from the robbers. Take me with you, no matter where, even to the cave where the demons of hell live. Will I follow you if you will but let me? You must, for I cannot be happy without you. Alas, cried the recluse, this cannot be. It is impossible, for I am a Japanese, not a Korean. Though I love you as much as you love me, we cannot be united. My name is Sawada Shigeoki. I am a samurai from Kurume. Ten years ago, I committed a political offense and had to fly from my country. I came to Korea disguised as a woodcutter 
and until I met you, I had not a happy day. Now our government is changed, and I am free to return home. To you I have told this story, and to you alone. Forgive my heartlessness in leaving you. I do so with tears in my eyes and sorrow in my heart. Farewell. So saying, the brave samurai, as my raconteur calls him, strode from the hut, never to see poor Choyo again. Choyo continued to weep until darkness came on and it was too late for her to return home in safety. So she spent the night where she was, in weeping. Next morning, she was found by her servants, almost demented with fever. She was carried to her home and for three months was seriously ill. On her recovery, she gave most of her money to temples and in charity. She sold her house, keeping only enough money to buy herself rice, and spent the remainder of her days alone in the little hut at the foot of Mount Kanzanrei, where at the age of 21, she was found dead of a broken heart. The samurai was brave, but was he noble in spite of his haughty national pride? To the Japanese mind, he acted as did Buddha when he renounced his worldly loves. What chance is there, if all men act thus, of a sincere friendship between Japan and Korea? End of chapter 34「Chapter 35 of Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Angelique Campbell, April 2019. Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan by Richard Gordon Smith. White Bone Mountain. At the foot, of Mount Shimongataki, up in the northwestern province of Ikijo, once stood, and probably even still stands, in rotten or repaired state, a temple of some importance, insomuch as it was the burial ground of the feudal Lord Yamana's ancestors. The name of the temple was Bumanji, and many high and important priests kept it up generation after generation, owing to the early help received from Lord Yamana's relations. Among the priests who presided over this temple was one named Araji Joan, who was the adopted son of the Otomo family. Araji was learned and virtuous, and had many followers, but one day the sight of a most attractive girl, called Kiku, meaning chrysanthemum, whose age was eighteen, upset all his religious equilibrium. He fell desperately in love with her offering to sacrifice his position and reputation if she would only listen to his prayer and marry him but the lovely okiku san refused all his entreaties a year later she was taken seriously ill with fever and died and whispers went abroad that araji the priest had cursed her in his jealousy and brought about her illness and her death the rumor was not exactly without reason, for Araji went mad within a week of Okiku's death. He neglected his services, and then got worse, running wildly about the temple, shrieking at night, and frightening all those who came near. Finally, one night, he dug up the body of Okiku and ate part of her flesh. People declared that he had turned into the devil, and none dared go near the temple. Even the younger priest left until at last he was alone. So terrified were the people, none approached the temple, which soon ran to rack and ruin. Thorny bushes were on the roof, moss on the hitherto polished and matted floors, birds built their nests inside, perched on the mortuary tables, and made a mess of everything. The temple, which had once been a masterpiece of beauty, became a rotting ruin. One summer evening, some six or seven months later, an old woman who owned a tea house at the foot of Shumangataki Mountain was about to close her shutters when she was terrified at the sight of a priest with a white cap on his head approaching. The devil priest! The devil priest! she cried as she slammed the last shutter in his face. Get away! Get away! We can't have you here! What do you mean by devil priest? I am a traveling or pilgrim priest, not a robber. 
let me in at once for i want both rest and refreshment cried the voice from outside the old woman looked through a crack in the shutters and saw that it was not the dreaded maniac but a venerable pilgrim priest so she opened the door and let him in profuse in her apologies and telling him how they were all frightened out of their wits by the priest of umanji temple who had gone mad over a love affair oh sir it is truly terrible we hardly dare go within half a mile of the temple now and some day the mad priest is sure to come out of it and kill some of us do you mean to tell me that a priest has so far forgotten himself as to break through the teachings of buddha and to make himself the slave of worldly passions asked the traveller i don't know about the worldly passions cried the old lady but our priest has turned into a devil as all the people hereabouts will tell you for he has even dug up and eaten of the flesh of the poor girl whom he caused to die by his cursing there have been instances of people turning devils said the priest but they are usually common people and not priests a courtier of the emperor sos turned into a serpent the wife of yoshi into a moth the mother of ogan into a yansha or vampire bat but i have never heard of a priest turning into a devil besides araji joan your priest at fumanji temple was a virtuous and clever man i have always heard i have come here in fact to do myself the honour of meeting him and to-morrow i shall go and see him the old lady served the priest with tea and begged him to think of no such thing but he persisted and said that on the morrow he would do as he mentioned and read the mad priest a lecture and then he laid himself down to rest for the night next afternoon the old priest true to his word started for the fumanji temple the old lady accompanying him for the first part of the walk to the place where the path which led to the temple turned up the mountain and there she bade him good-bye refusing to go another step the sun was beginning to set as the priest came in sight of the temple and he saw that the place was in great disorder the gates had tumbled off their hinges withered leaves were thickly strewn everywhere and crumpled under his feet but he walked boldly on and struck a small temple bell with his staff at the sound came many birds and bats from the temple the bats flapping round his head but there was no other sign of life he struck the bell again with renewed force and it boomed and clanged in echoes at last a thin miserable-looking priest came out and looking wildly about said who are you and why have you come here the temple has long since been deserted for some reason which i cannot understand if you want lodging you must go to the village there is neither food nor bedding here i am a priest from wakasa province the pretty scenery and clear streams have caused me to linger long on my journey it is too late now to go to the village and i am too tired so please let me remain for the night said the priest the other made answer i cannot order you away the place is no longer more than a ruined shed you can stay if you like but you can have neither food nor bedding having said this he sat on the corner of a rock while the pilgrim priest sat on another close by neither spoke until it was dark and the moon had risen then the mad priest said find what place you can inside to sleep there are no beds but what there is of the roof keeps the mountain dew from falling on you during the night and it falls heavily here and wets you through then he went into the temple the pilgrim priest could not tell where for it was dark and he could not follow the place being littered with idols and beams and furniture which the mad priest had hacked to pieces in the early stages of his madness the pilgrim therefore felt his way about until he found himself between a large fallen idol and a wall and here he decided to spend the night it being as safe a place in which to hide from the maniac as any he could find without knowing his way about or having a light fortunately for himself he was a strong and healthy old man and was well able to do without food and also to stand unharmed the piercing and damp cold the pilgrim priest could hear the sound of the many streams which gurgled down the mountain side there was also the unpleasant sound of squeaking rats as they chased and fought and of bats which flew in and out of the place and of hooting owls but beyond this nothing 
nothing of the mad priest hour after hour passed thus until one o'clock when suddenly just as the pilgrim felt himself dozing off he was aroused by a noise the whole temple seemed as if it were being knocked down shutters were slammed with such violence that they fell to the floor right and left idols and furniture were being hurled about in and out ran the sound of the naked pattering feet of the crazed priest who shouted oh where is the beautiful okiku my sweetly beloved okiku oh where oh where is she the gods and the devils have combined to defraud me of her and i care for neither and defy them all kiku kiku come to me the pilgrim thinking his cramped position would be dangerous if the maniac came near him availed himself of an opportunity when the latter was in a far-off part of the temple to get out into the grounds and hide himself again it would be easier to see what went on thought he and to run if necessary he hid himself first in one part of the grounds and then in another meanwhile the mad priest paid several rushing visits to the outsides of the temple keeping up all the time his awful cries for okiku towards morning he retired once more to the part of the temple in which he lived and no more noise was made our pilgrim then went forth from his hiding and seated himself in the rock which he had occupied the evening before determined to see if he could not force a conversation with the demented man and read him a lesson from the sacred teachings of buddha he sat patiently on until the sun was high but all remained silent there was no sign of the mad priest towards midday the pilgrim heard sounds in the temple and bind by the madman came out looking as if he had just recovered from a drunken orgy he appeared dazed and was quiet and started as he saw the old priest seated on the rock as he had been the night before the old man rose and approaching him said my friend my name is ungai i am a brother priest from the temple of dagoji in wakasa province i came hither to see you hearing of your great wisdom but last night i heard in the village that you had broken your vows as a priest and lost your heart to a maiden and that from love of her you have turned into a dangerous demon i have in consequence considered it my duty to come and read you a lecture as it is impossible to pass your conduct unnoticed pray listen to the lecture and tell me if i can help you the mad priest answered quite meekly you are indeed a buddha please tell me what i can do to forget the past and to become a holy and virtuous priest once more ungai answered come out here in the grounds and seat yourself on this rock then he read a lecture out of the buddhist bible and finished by saying and now if you wish to redeem your soul you must sit on this rock until you are able to explain the following lines which are written in the sacred book the moon on the lake shines on the winds between the pine trees and a long night grows quiet at midnight having said this ungai bowed low and left the mad priest joan sitting on the rock reflecting for a month ungai wandered from temple to temple lecturing at the end of that time he came back by way of homonji temple and thought he would go up to it and see what had happened to mad joan at the tea-house in which he had first put up he asked the old landlady if she had seen or heard any more of the crazy priest no she said we have neither seen nor heard of him some people say he has left but no one knows for none dare go up to the temple to see well said ungai i will go up to-morrow morning and find out next morning ungai went to the temple and found joan still seated exactly as he had left him on the rock muttering the words the moon on the lake shines on the winds between the pine trees and a long night grows quiet at midnight joan's hair and beard had become long and gray in the time and he appeared to be miserably thin and almost transparent ungai was struck with pity at joan's righteous determination and patience and tears came to his eyes get up get up said he or indeed you are a holy and determined man but joan did not move ungai poked him with the staff to awaken him as he thought but to his horror joan fell to pieces and disappeared like a flake of melting snow 
ungai stayed in the temple for three days praying for the soul of joan the villagers hearing of this generous action rebuilt the temple and made him their priest their temple had formerly belonged to the mitsu sect but now it was transferred to ungai's jodu sect and the temple or name of umanji was changed to hakatsuzan white bone mountain the temple is said to have prospered for hundreds of years after End of chapter thirty five Chapter thirty six of Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan by Richard Gordon Smith. A Stormy Night's Tragedy. Footnote Fukuga told me this story and vouches for its accuracy. End of footnote. All who have read anything of Japanese history must have heard of Saigo Takamori, who lived between the years 1827 and 1877. He was a great imperialist, fighting for the emperor until 1876, when he gave over, owing to his disapproval of the Europeanization going on in the country and the abandonment of ancient national ways. As practical commander-in-chief of the imperial army, Saigo fled to Kagoshima, where he raised a body of faithful followers, which was the beginning of the Satsuma Rebellion. The imperialists defeated them, and in September of 1877, Saigo was killed, some say in the last battle, and others that he did seppuku, and that his head was cut off and secretly buried, so that it should not fall into the hands of his enemies. Saigo Takamori was highly honored even by the imperialists. It is hard to call him a rebel. He did not rebel against his emperor, but only against the revolting idea of becoming Europeanized. Who can say that he was not right? He was a man of fine sentiment and great loyalty. Should all of us follow meekly the imperial order in England if we were told that we were to practice the manners and customs of South Sea Islanders? That would be hardly less revolting to us than Europeanization was to Saigo. In the first year of Meiji, 1868, the Tokugawa army had been badly beaten by Saigo at Fushimi, and Field Marshal Tokugawa Keiki had the greatest difficulty in getting down to the sea and escaping to Yedo. The imperial army proceeded along the Tokaido Road, determined to break up the Tokugawa force. Their advance guard had reached Hiratsuka under Mount Fuji on the coast. It was a spring day, the 5th of April, and the cherry trees were in full bloom. The country folk had come in to see the victorious troops, who formed the advance guard of those who had beaten the Tokugawa. There were many beggars about, together with peddlers and sellers of sweets, roasted potatoes, and what not. Towards evening, clouds came over the skies. At five o'clock, rain began. At six, everyone was under cover. At the principal inn were a party of the headquarters staff officers, including the gallant Saigo. They were making the best of the bad weather and not feeling particularly lively when they heard the soft and melodious notes of the shakuhachi at the gate. That is the poor blind beggar we saw playing near the temple today, said one. Yes, so it is, said another. The poor fellow must be very wet and miserable. Let us call him in. Capital idea, assented all of them, among whom was Saigo Takamori. We will have him in and raise a subscription for him if he can raise our spirits in this weather. They gave the landlord an order to admit the blind flute player. The poor man was led in by a side door and brought into the presence of the officers. Gentlemen, said he, you have done me a very great honor and a kindness, for it is not pleasant to stand outside playing in the rain with cotton clothes on. I think I can repay you, for I am said to play the shakuhachi well. Since I have been blind, it has become my only pleasure, and not only that, but also my only means of living. It is hard now in these unsettled days, when everything is upside down, to earn a living. Not many travelers come to the inns while the imperial troops occupy them. These are hard days, gentlemen. They may be hard days for you, poor blind fellow, but say nothing against the imperial troops, for we have to be suspicious, there being spies of the Tokugawa. Three eyes, indeed, does each of us need in his head. Well, well, I have no wish to say aught against the imperial troops, said the blind man. All I have to say is that it is precious hard for a blind man to earn enough rice wherewith to fill his stomach. Only once a week, on average, am I called to play to private parties, or to shampoo some rheumatic person such as this wet weather produces the blessing of the gods be on it. 
"'Well, we will see what we can do for you, poor fellow,' said Saigo. "'Go round the room and see what you can collect, and then we will start the concert.' Matsuichi did as he was bid, and returned to Saigo some ten minutes later with five or six yen, to which Saigo added, saying, "'There, poor fellow, what do you think of that? Say no more that the imperial troops cause you to have an empty belly.' Say, rather, that if you lived near them long, the skin of your belly might become so overstretched as to cause you perforce to open your eyes, and then indeed you might find yourself put about for a trade. But let us hear your music. We are dull of spirit tonight and want enlivening. Oh, gentlemen, this is too much, far too much for my poor music. Take some of it back. No, no, they answered. We are troops and officers of the Imperial Army. Our lives are uncertain from day to day. It is a pleasure to give and to enjoy music when we can. The blind man began to play, and he played long and late. Sometimes his airs were lively, and at other times as mournful as the spring wind which blew through the cherry trees. But his manner was enchanting, and all were grateful to him for having afforded a night's amusement. At eleven o'clock the concert finished, and they went to rest. The blind beggar left the inn, and Kato Shichibe, the proprietor, locked it up, in spite of the sentries posted outside. The inn was surrounded by hedges, and several clumps of bamboos stood in the corners. At the far end was an artificial mountain with a lake at its foot, and near the lake a little summer house, over which towered a huge and ancient pine tree, one of the branches of which stretched right back over the roof of the inn. At about one o'clock in the morning, the form of a man might have been seen stealthily climbing this huge tree until he had reached the branch which hung over the inn. There he stretched himself flat and began squirming along, evidently intent upon reaching the upper floor of the house. Unfortunately for himself, he cracked a small branch of dead wood, and the sound caused a sentry to look up. "'Who goes there?' cried he, bringing his musket round. But there was no answer. The sentry shouted for help, and it was not more than twenty seconds before the whole house was up and out. No escape for the man on the tree was possible. He was taken prisoner.' Imagine the astonishment of all when they found that he was the blind beggar, but now not blind at all. His eyes flashed fire of indignation at his captors, for the great plan of his young life was dead. Who is he? cried one and all, and why the trickery of being blind last evening? A spy, that's what he is, a Tokugawa spy, said one. Take him to headquarters, so that the chief officers may interrogate him, and be careful to hold his hands, for he has every appearance of being a samurai and a fighter. And so the prisoner was led off to the temple of Homanji, where the headquarters of the staff temporarily were. The prisoner was brought into the presence of Saigo Takamori and four other imperial officers, one of whom was Katsura Kogoro. He was made to kneel. Then Saigo, who was the chief, said, Hold your head up and give us your name. The prisoner answered, I am Watanabe Tatsuzo. I am one of those who have the honor of belonging to the bodyguard of the Tokugawa government. You are bold, said Saigo. Will you have the goodness to tell us why you have been masquerading as a blind beggar, and why you were caught in an attempt to break into the inn? I found that the imperial ambassador was sleeping there, and our cause is not bettered by killing ordinary officers. You are a fool, answered Saigo. How much better would you find yourself off if you killed Yanagiwara, Hashimoto, or Katsura? Your question is stupid, was the unabashed answer. Every man of us does his little. My efforts are only a fragment, but little by little we shall gain our ends. Have you a comrade here? asked Saigo. Oh, no, answered the prisoner. We act individually as we think best for the cause. It was my intention to kill any one of importance whose death might strengthen us. I was acting entirely as I thought best. And Saigo said, Your loyalty does you credit, and I admire you for that. But you should recognize that after the last victory of the imperial troops at Fushimi, the Tokugawa's tenure of office, extending over three hundred years, has come to an end. It is only natural that the imperial family should return to power. Your intention is presumably to support a power that is finished. Have you never heard the proverb which says that no single support can hold a falling tower? Now tell me truthfully the absurd ideas which appear to exist in your mind. Do you really think that the Tokugawa have any further chance? If you were any other than the heroic or admirable Saigo, I should refuse to answer these questions, said the prisoner. But, as you are the great Saigo Takamori, and I admire your loyalty and courage, I will confess that after our defeat, some two hundred of us samurai formed into a society swearing to sacrifice our lives to the cause in any way that we were able. 
I regret to say that nearly all ran away, and that I am, as far as I am able to judge, about the only one left. As you will execute me, there will be none. Stop, cried Saigo. Say no more. Let me ask you, will you not join us? Look upon the Tokugawa as dead. Too many faithful but ignorant samurai have died for them. The imperial family must reign. Nine-tenths of the country demand it. Though your guilt stands confessed, your loyalty is admirable, and we should gladly take you to our side. Think before you answer. No thought was necessary. Watanabe Tatsuzo answered instantly. No, never. Though alone, I will not be unfaithful to my cause. You'd better behead me before the day dawns. I see the strength of your arguments that the imperial family must and should reign, but that cannot alter my decision with regard to my own fate. Saigo stood up and said, Here is a man whom we must respect. There are many Tokugawa who have joined our cause through fear, but they retain hate in their hearts. Look, all of you, at this Watanabe, and forget him not, for he is a noble man and true to the death. So saying, Saigo bowed to Watanabe, and then, turning to the guard, said, Take the prisoner to the Sambon Matsu and behead him as soon as the day dawns. Footnote. Sambon Matsu is three pines. End of footnote. Watanabe Tatsuzo was led forth and executed accordingly. There is a crossroad on the way leading to Mariko, on the right of the Nita Ferry. Some five or six cho from the hill where is the Homanji Temple, Ikegami, in Abaragun, Tokyofu, where there is a little grave with a tombstone over it with characters written thereon. They mean Tomb of Futsetsushi, and it is here that Watanabe Tatsuzo is said to have been buried. End of chapter 36 Recording by Colleen McMahon Chapter 37 of Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan by Richard Gordon Smith. The Kakemono Ghost of Aki Province. Footnote. About 250 years ago, a strange legend was attached to a kakemono which was painted by an artist celebrity, Sawara Kameju by name, and, owing to the reasons given in the story, the kakemono was handed over to the safekeeping of the head priest of the Karinji Temple. End of footnote. Down the inland sea, between Umadaichi and Kore, now a great naval port, and in the province of Aki, there is a small village called Yaiyama, in which lived a painter of some note, Abe Tenko. Abe Tenko taught more than he painted, and relied for his living mostly on the small means to which he had succeeded at his father's death, and on the aspiring artists who boarded in the village for the purpose of taking daily lessons from him. The island and rock scenery in the neighborhood afforded continual study, and Tenko was never short of pupils. Among them was one scarcely more than a boy, being only seventeen years of age. His name was Sawara Kameju, and a most promising pupil he was. He had been sent to Tenko over a year before, when scarce sixteen years of age, and for the reason that Tenko had been a friend of his father, Sawara was taken under the roof of the artist and treated as if he had been his son. Tenko had had a sister who went into the service of the Lord of Aki, by whom she had a daughter. Had the child been a son, it would have been adopted into the Aki family. But being a daughter, it was, according to Japanese custom, sent back to its mother's family, with the result that Tenko took charge of the child, whose name was Kimi. The mother being dead, the child had lived with him for 16 years. Our story opens with Okimi grown into a pretty girl. Okimi was a most devoted adopted daughter to Tenko. She attended almost entirely to his household affairs, and Tenko looked upon her as if, indeed, she were his own daughter, instead of an illegitimate niece, trusting her in everything. After the arrival of the young student, Okimi's heart gave her much trouble. She fell in love with him. Sawara admired Okimi greatly, but of love he never said a word, being too much absorbed in his study. He looked upon Kimi as a sweet girl, taking his meals with her and enjoying her society. He would have fought for her, and he loved her, but he never gave himself time to think that she was not his sister, and that he might make love to her. So it came to pass, at last, that Okimi, one day, with the pains of love in her heart, 
availed herself of her guardian's absence at the temple, whither he had gone to paint something for the priests. Okimi screwed up her courage and made love to Sawara. She told him that since he had come to the house, her heart had known no peace. She loved him, and would like to marry him if he did not mind. This simple and maiden-like request, accompanied by the offer of tea, was more than young Sawara was able to answer without acquiescence. After all, it did not much matter, thought he. Kimi is a most beautiful and charming girl, and I like her very much, and must marry some day. So Sawara told Kimi that he loved her, and would be only too delighted to marry her when his studies were complete, say, two or three years thence. Kimi was overjoyed, and, on the return of the good Tenko from Korinji Temple, informed her guardian of what had passed. Sawara set to with renewed vigor, and worked diligently, improving very much in his style of painting. And after a year, Tenko thought it would do him good to finish off his studies in Kyoto, under an old friend of his own, a painter named Sumiyoshi Miyokei. Thus it was that in the spring of the sixth year of Kyoho, that is, in 1721, Sawara bade farewell to Tenko and his pretty niece Okimi, and started forth to the capital. It was a sad parting. Sawara had grown to love Kimi very deeply, and he vowed that as soon as his name was made, he would return and marry her. In the olden days, the Japanese were even more shockingly poor correspondents than they are now, and even lovers or engaged couples did not write to each other, as several of my tales may show. After Sawara had been away for a year, it seemed that he should write and say at all events how he was getting on, but he did not do so. A second year passed, and still there was no news. In the meantime, there had been several admirers of Okimi's who had proposed Tenko for her hand, but Tenko had invariably said that Kimi-san was already engaged, until one day he heard from Miyokei, the painter in Kyoto, who told him that Sawara was making splendid progress, and that he was most anxious that the youth should marry his daughter. He felt that he must ask his old friend Tenko first, and before speaking to Sawara. Tenko, on the other hand, had an application from a rich merchant for Okimi's hand. What was Tenko to do? Sawara showed no signs of returning. On the contrary, it seemed that Miyokei was anxious to get him to marry into his family. That must be a good thing for Sawara, he thought. Miyokei is a better teacher than I and if Sawara marries his daughter, he will take more interest than ever in my old pupil. Also, it is advisable that Kimi should marry that rich young merchant, if I can persuade her to do so. But it will be difficult, for she loves Sawara still. I am afraid he has forgotten her. A little strategy I will try, and tell her that Miyokei has written to tell me that Sawara is going to marry his daughter. Then, possibly, she may feel sufficiently vengeful to agree to marry the young merchant. Arguing thus to himself, he wrote to Miyokei to say that he had his full consent to ask Sawara to be his son-in-law, and he wished him every success in the effort, and in the evening he spoke to Kimi. Kimi, he said, today I have had news of Sawara through my friend Miyokei. Oh, do tell me what, cried the excited Kimi. Is he coming back, and has he finished his education? How delighted I shall be to see him. We can be married in April when the cherry blooms, and he can paint a picture of our first picnic. I fear, Kimi, the news which I have does not talk of his coming back. On the contrary, I am asked by Miyokei to allow Sawara to marry his daughter, and, as I think such a request could not have been made had Sawara been faithful to you, I have answered that I have no objection to the union. And now, as for yourself, I deeply regret to tell you this, but as your uncle and guardian, I again wish to impress upon you the advisability of marrying Yorozoya, the young merchant who is deeply in love with you and in every way a most desirable husband. Indeed, I must insist upon it, for I think it is most desirable. Poor Kimi-san broke into tears and deep sobs, and without answering a word, went to her room, where Tenko thought it well to leave her alone for the night. In the morning she had gone, none knew whither, there being no trace of her. Up in Kyoto, Sawara continued his studies, true and faithful to Okimi. After receiving Tenko's letter approving of Miyokei's asking Sawara to become his son-in-law, Miyokei asked Sawara if he would so honor him. When you marry my daughter, we shall be a family of painters, 
and I think you will be one of the most celebrated ones that Japan ever had. But, sir, cried Sawara, I cannot do myself the honor of marrying your daughter, for I am already engaged, I have been for the last three years, to Kimi, Tenko's daughter. It is most strange that he should not have told you. There was nothing for Miyokei to say to this, but there was much for Sawara to think about. Foolish, perhaps he then thought, were the ways of Japanese in not corresponding more freely. He wrote to Kimi twice accordingly, but no answer came. Then Miyokei fell ill of a chill and died. So Sawara returned to his village home in Aki, where he was welcomed by Tenko, who was now, without Okimi, lonely in his old age. When Sawara heard that Kimi had gone away, leaving neither address nor letter, he was very angry, for he had not been told the reason. An ungrateful and bad girl, said he to Tenko, and I have been lucky indeed in not marrying her. Yes, yes, said Tenko, you have been lucky, but you must not be too angry. Women are queer things, and, as the saying goes, when you see water running uphill and hens laying square eggs, you may expect to see a truly honest-minded woman. But come now, I want to tell you that as I am growing old and feeble, I wish to make you the master of my house and property here. You must take my name and marry. Feeling disgusted at Okimi's conduct, Sawara readily consented. A pretty young girl, daughter of a wealthy farmer, was found, Kiku, the chrysanthemum, and she and Sawara lived happily with old Tenko, keeping his house and minding his estate. Sawara painted in his spare time. Little by little, he became quite famous. One day, the Lord of Aki sent for him and said it was his wish that Sawara should paint the seven beautiful scenes of the islands of Kabakarijima, six, probably. The pictures were to be mounted on gold screens. This was the first commission that Sawara had had from such a high official. He was very proud of it, and went off to the upper and lower Kabakari Islands, where he made rough sketches. He went also to the rocky islands of Shikokujima and to the little uninhabited island of Daikokujima, where an adventure befell him. Strolling along the shore, he met a girl, tanned by sun and wind. She wore only a red cotton cloth about her loins, and her hair fell upon her shoulders. She had been gathering shellfish, and had a basket of them under her arm. Sawara thought it strange that he should meet a single woman in so wild a place, and more so still when she addressed him, saying, Surely you are Sawara Kameju, are you not? Yes, answered Sawara, I am. But it is very strange that you should know me. May I ask how you do so? If you are Sawara, as I know you are, you should know me without asking, for I am no other than Kimi, to whom you are engaged. Sawara was astonished and hardly knew what to say. So he asked her questions as to how she had come to this lonely island. Okimi explained everything and ended by saying, with a smile of happiness upon her face, And since, my dearest Sawara, I understand that what I was told is false, and that you did not marry Miyokei's daughter, and that we have been faithful to each other, we can be married and happy after all. Oh, think how happy we shall be! Alas, alas, my dear Kimi, it cannot be! I was led to suppose that you had deserted our benefactor Tenko and given up all thought of me. Oh, the sadness of it all, the wickedness! I have been persuaded that you were faithless and have been made to marry another. Okimi made no answer, but began to run along the shore, towards a little hut, which home she had made for herself. She ran fast, and Sawara ran after her, calling, Kimi, Kimi, stop and speak to me! But Kimi did not stop. She gained her hut, and seizing a knife, plunged it into her throat, and fell back, bleeding to death. Sawara, greatly grieved, burst into tears. It was horrible to see the girl who might have been his bride lying dead at his feet, all covered with blood, and having suffered so horrible a death at her own hands. Greatly impressed, he drew paper from his pocket and made a sketch of the body. Then he and his boatmen buried Okimi above the tide mark near the primitive hut. Afterwards, at home, with a mournful heart, he painted a picture of the dead girl and hung it in his room. On the first night that it was hung, Sawara had a dreadful dream. On awakening, he found the figure on the kakemono seemed to be alive. The ghost of Okimi stepped out of it and stood near his bed. Night after night the ghost appeared, until sleep and rest for Sawara were no longer possible. There was nothing to be done, thought he, but to send his wife back to her parents, which he did and the kakemono he presented to the Karinji temple, 
where the priest kept it with great care and daily prayed for the spirit of Okimisan. After that, Sawara saw the ghost no more. The kakemono is called the ghost picture of Tenko II and is said to be still kept in the Kurinji Temple, where it was placed some 230 to 240 years ago. End of chapter 37. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Chapter 38 of Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Ancient Tales and Folklore of Japan by Richard Gordon Smith white saki two thousand or more years ago lake biwa in omi province and mount fuji in suruga province came into being in one night though my story relates this as fact you are fully entitled to say should you feel so inclined wonderful indeed are the ways of nature but do so respectfully if you please and without levity for otherwise you will grossly offend and will not understand the ethical ideas of japanese folklore stories well at the time of this extraordinary geographical event there lived one urine a man of poor means even for those days he loved sake wine and scarcely ever spent a day without drinking some of it urine lived near the place which is now called suzukawa a little to the north of the river known as fujikawa on the day which followed fuji san's appearance urine became ill and was in consequence unable to drink his cup of sake he became worse and worse and at last feeling that there could be no hope for him decided to give himself the pleasure of drinking a cup before he died accordingly he called to himself his only son koryuri a boy of fourteen years and told him to go and fetch him a cup or two of the wine koyuri was sorely perplexed he had no sake in the house and there was not a single coin left wherewith to buy this he did not like to tell his father fearing that the unpleasant state of affairs might make him worse so he took his gourd and went wandering along the beach wondering how he could get what his father wanted while thus employed koyuri heard a voice calling him by name as he looked up towards the pines which fringed the beach he saw a man and a woman sitting beneath an immense tree their hair was a scarlet red and so were their bodies at first koyuri was afraid he had never seen their like before but the voice was kindly and the man was making signs to him to approach koyuri did so in fear and trembling but with that coolness with which characterizes the japanese boy as koyuri approached the strange people he noticed that they were drinking sake from large flat cups known as saka de zuki and that on the sand beside them was an immense jar from which they took the liquor moreover he noticed that the sake was whiter than any he had seen before thinking always of his father koyuri unslung his gourd reported his father's illness and begged for sake the red man took the gourd and filled it after expressing gratitude koyuri ran off delighted here father here said he as he reached his hut i have got you the sake 
the best i have ever seen and i am sure it tastes as good as it looks try it and tell me the old man took the wine and drank greedily expressing great satisfaction and said was indeed the best he had ever tasted next day he wanted more the boy found his two red friends and again they filled the gourd in short koyuri had his gourd filled for five days in succession and his father had regained spirits and was almost well in consequence now there lived in the next hut to urine an unpleasant neighbor who was also fond of sake but too poor to procure it his name was mami kiko on hearing that urine had been drinking sake for the last five days he became furiously jealous and calling koyuri asked where and how he had procured it the boy explained that he had got it from the strange people with red hair who had been living near the big pine tree for some days past give me your gourd to taste cried mammy kiko snatching it roughly do you think that your father is the only man who is good enough for sake putting the gourd to his lips he began to drink but he threw it down in disgust a second later and spat out what was in his mouth what filth is this he cried to your father you give the most excellent sake while to me you give foul water what is the meaning of it he gave koyuri a sound beating and then told him to lead the way to the red people on the beach saying i will beat you again if i don't get some good sake so you had better see to it koyuri led the way weeping the while at the loss of his sake which mammy kiko had thrown away and fearing the anger of his red friends in the usual place they found the strangers who had both been drinking and were still doing so mammy kiko was surprised at their appearance he had seen nothing quite like them before their bodies were of the pink of cherry blossom shining in the sun while their long red hair almost frightened him both were naked except for a green girdle made of some curious seaweed well boy koyuri what are you crying about and why back so soon has your father drunk the sake already if so he must be almost as fond of it as we no no my father has not drunk it but mammy kiko here took it from me and drank some spitting it out and saying it was not sake the rest he threw away and then made me bring him here may i have some more for my father the red man refilled the gourd and told him not to mind and seemed amused at koyuri's account of mamikiko spitting it out i am as fond of sake as any one cried mamikiko will you give me some oh yes help yourself said the red man help yourself mamikiko filled the largest of the cups and putting it to his nose smelt the fragrance which was delicious but as soon as he put it to his lips his face changed and he had to spit again for the taste was nauseating what is the meaning of this he cried angrily and the red man answered still more angrily you do not seem to be aware of who i am well i will tell you that i am a shoujo of high degree and i live deep in the bottom of the ocean near the sea dragon's palace recently we heard that a sacred mountain had arisen on the edge of the sea and as it is a lucky omen 
and a sign that the empire of japan will exist in perpetuity i have come here to see it while enjoying the magnificent scene from suruga coast i met this good boy koyuri who asked for sake for his poor sick old father and i gave him some now this sake is not ordinary sake but sacred and those who drink it live for ever and retain their youth moreover it cures all diseases even in the aged but you must know that any medicine is sometimes a poison and thus it is that this sweet sacred white sake is good only in taste to the righteous and bad tasting and poisonous to the wicked thus i know that as it tastes evil to you you are an evil and wicked man selfish and greedy and both the sojos laughed at mamikiko who on hearing that the few drops which he must have swallowed would act as a poison and soon kill him begged to cry with fear and to regret his conduct he begged and implored forgiveness and that his life might be spared and vowed that he would reform if only given a chance the shoujo drawing some powder from a case gave it to mamikiko and told him to swallow it in some sake for said he it is better to repent and reform even in your old age than not at all mamikiko drank it down this time finding the wine sweet and delicious it strengthened him and made him feel well and he reformed and became a good man he made friends again with urine and treated koyuri well some years later mamikiko and urine built a hut at the southern base of fujisan where they brewed white sake from a recipe given them by the shoujo and they gave it to all who suffered from sake poisoning both mamikiko and urine lived for three hundred years in the middle ages a man who had heard this story brewed white sake at the foot of mount fuji he made it with rice yeast and people became very fond of it even today white sake is brewed somewhere at the foot of the mountain and is well known as a special liqueur belonging to fiji i myself drank it in 1907 without fear of living beyond my 55th year end of chapter 38 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc so there we go that was the last story and i actually got what i hope to be enough beads strung to uh finish the project well almost i need a little bit more i think because um i'm doing a beaded bracelet out of size 11 seed beads and um size 10 crochet cotton eh, sorry no but no sake for you i know i prefer ice cream anyway <laughs> is it still busy for you honey should we do another story I think I'm just going to do another story. Nah, you know what? I'm not going to do another story tonight. I'm going to try and get this bit started. And, um, 
and see if it if I can get it get a project done. So because uh, it's a bit late, I've got a headache, so I'm going to quit for tonight. I've got a figure about a six inch bracelet. Exactly. Excuse me. And um, so you need. Apparently the formula is uh, per one inch of brace that you need or whatever you need. Still busy. Aw. You need to have multiply that number by however many beads wide the project's going to be. So my beads are. Um, you know, the pattern is six beads round. It's just uh, going to be a rainbow spiral project. And um, what's going to happen is it's going to be a bracelet that should be around around six inches, six and a half inches, I believe my wrists are. But so I'm going to give it a little extra just in case. And um, but also you have to get a oh yeah you do need quite a bit extra actually because it it sits off quite a bit so I'm thinking I'm gonna give give it another another five inches or so maybe another six inches just in case or not six inches uh, yeah it's a six by yeah, another six inches just to give it some extra, extra room because the, um, with being how, with being the length that it's going to be, which is, I want it to sit six inches, and then it has to be off your arm a bit because it's got some girth to it. Uh, it's, um, yeah, you know. You gotta have the right amounts. Well, you don't have to. You can cut the thread and and whatnot. But I really don't like doing that. I like having enough on there to finish the project and then um, go from there. Excuse me. Be. So um, I'm gonna try and add some more. Maybe we'll do another story. We'll do one more story, I think, and I can I can continue stringing. Yeah, I'm I'm having one of those days. I think I'm gonna quit and maybe go for a nap because I'm a bit tired now. I can really see what I'm doing. So no good trying to bead when you can't see the beads. Right, right. So thank you for coming. I really, 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 really appreciate it. It's nice. Listen to, to a few stories with you and get a bit of work done. A, uh, what, it's an applesauce cup or pudding cup or something. It's really good for keeping a little ball of yarn, uh, crochet cotton still from running away. <laughs> um, I don't usually ball up my own yarn like this, but uh, this was one that I had gotten from the thrift store, I believe, and um, so it was already like that. Focus, be the bead. <laughs> You're so funny, honey. <laughs> that's, that's pretty darn funny. <laughs> be the bead. <laughs> so that would be, we can, we can, we, we we need to put a needle through. <laughs> I guess the illusion wasn't quite there. <laughs> okay, guys. Uh, thanks for coming by. I really appreciate it. You have a wonderful night. Love you. Bye. Oops, I almost hit the wrong button. <laughs>